Hey all, Scott here. In my spare time, I like to pit two entities picked at random against each other. Let's see what the first fighter is. Okay, it's gonna be myself, guilty as charged. Let's see who's next. Okay, Gizmondo widescreen. I already compare myself enough to that every day. What's the category we're fighting in? This isn't even Gizmondo widescreen's first win. The Wii U actually released, what did you do today? 250 games slash babies are born every minute. They're both bustling industries. But because of how many games start development, it's fair to expect a good chunk of them to never reach completion. Game projects get canceled, it happens. They're such complicated pieces of media that sometimes things just end up failing to come together. But if games are so complicated, how complicated are the cartons you play them on? Listen, I'm not trying to downplay how difficult video games are to work on, but the video game consoles themselves, that's a whole different story. To successfully create a video game platform, a company has to talk to hundreds of other companies to see what they want out of gaming hardware, make deals, get games to come to the platform, get exclusive games in development, advertise the system itself alongside the games for it, create unique features, menu systems, all for a reasonable price. Developing a game system not only requires the creation of hardware, but fundamentally requires getting multiple other games in development, and because of that, yet yeah, not a lot of people make game systems as a hobby. I mean, EA could probably put out their own platform if they wanted to, but I have multiple questions, and they're all, why would they do that? There's a reason only three big console manufacturers exist now, and whenever somebody else tries to enter the ring, everybody can't stop laughing. It is incredibly risky to create a video game platform, with how much money has to get poured into not only creating the hardware, but funding exclusive game development, it's obvious why it's a three-man game. But that's not to say others haven't tried or the big guys haven't attempted to launch other consoles with plans falling through. Cancelled game consoles are some of the most elusive portions of video game history. I mean, even if a company is developing a console and things aren't going too hot, I mean, Jesus, man, you've already spent this much money. Just release it for kicks at that point. A game that's never seen the light of day. We're all pretty used to that. A game console itself, though, that's a bit more rare. Full platforms that were planned yet never saw the light of day. And what do you know? One of them happened to be Atari Game Brain. Oh, yeah, of course, the Atari Game Brain. Can't have video games without the Atari Game Brain. The Game Brain was designed to play 10 of Atari's games at home. Pong, Super Pong, Ultra Pong, Video Pinball, the classics. This was in the era of the Pong console. Cheap little consoles you could buy that do one thing and one thing well, play Pong. The Game Brain was a bit different, though. It was sort of a Pong console, sort of a regular video game platform. See, it would have had cartridges, and you could play different games by swapping out the cartridges. But it would only be able to play those 10 games. It wasn't designed to have a limitless library of titles. It was fundamentally a Pong console with a few variations of Pong you could select, but those variations would have been sold as separate cartridges to be... Uh... They decided against releasing the system because, I mean, the Atari 2600 was already out at that point. Who wanted this? Well, Atari was not one to shy away from shying away from releasing game consoles because around this time they were developing a handheld system, the Atari Cosmos. The big selling point of this thing was going to be its holographic display. It was 1981. From what I could gather, the Cosmos had only nine games planned for it, and all of them were pretty much programmed into the system itself, kind of like the Game Brain. The cartridges you would use to activate the games contained the holograms, which I believe were pretty much those 3D looking pictures that move when you do. So one of the games was Asteroids. I believe you'd be playing Asteroids with a 3D looking picture in the background. Well, at least it wasn't the Intellivision 3. There's a reason these two things never came together. The Intellivision, Mattel's competitor to the Atari 2600, had a phone controller. It'll always have that against me. The Intellivision 2. Mattel's answer to fan demands for another Intellivision. It was a cheaper version of the Intellivision. I love their use of two. But the Intellivision 3 was supposed to be a true successor, like a next-gen system. What the hell was the point of calling this one too? But no, the Intellivision 3 wasn't the real next-gen system, that was gonna be the Intellivision 4! Intellivision 3 was just to hold consumers over until that fateful day. I have specifically thought to myself, I will never legitimately say this, but Mattel lost their minds. Let's go back to Atari. You ever use the Atari 2600 and say, I wish it would sit on my lap? Well, they almost had you covered. The CX2500 and CX2000, these were to be budget versions of the 2600, but this time with the controllers on the console itself. Sure, I mean, I'm open to bullshit. There was going to be the Atari 2700, which was basically a version of the 2600 with built-in wireless controllers. You could buy a wireless adapter for the original system, but sadly this variant never saw the light of day. Then they worked on the Atari Mirai, which is famous for nothing. The system's purpose was never known. All we know is that somebody found the outer casing, and it never released. That's it. 
Things would be truly different if the Atari Mirai actually released. For starters, I wouldn't be talking about it right now. But the Konix multi-system has one leg up on the Mirai. It has like this much more information out there. You could have gotten a chair with it. This system was supposed to be the most immersive thing on the planet. It had so many different controller configurations, force feedback, a chair you could have gotten with it. This was supposed to be the ultimate video game system. Half of this stuff seems like the fake kind of video game accessories you'd see people playing with in movies, but this was real life. Mm. Konix pretty much bit off more than they could chew with this thing. They crammed so much in here that it just wasn't feasible to release. The multi-system faded away, and the remnants of the project were purchased by Atari and eventually became the Atari Jaguar. Good. Speaking of the Jaguar, Atari was creating a system alongside it called the Panther. But this was scrapped to put more resources into the more powerful system. That. Listen, I love hotel rooms. You get free water bottles and bed bugs. But what I love most is when you have those hardwired video game controllers connected to the TV where you could play games for a small giant fee on your hotel bill. Well, what if there was a console that was like playing hotel games at home? The Taito Wow Wow Woo Woo was already copyrighted. It was going to play games off of CD or for a small fee, you could download games via satellite. It's a hotel in the home. This was canceled probably due to budgetary reasons. At the time, it was a bit expensive cramming a CD-ROM drive and a satellite receiver into one console. Around the same time, Bandai was trying out their own CD-based game console, the Bandai Hit or HAT, or Home Entertainment Terminal. You guys know me, I love video game console names that sound like airports. So this was pretty much a Super Famicom with a CD drive and in the form of a laptop with various other features that I have no idea how they'd be used. It was portable and had a stylus for Super Famicom games. So why was Bandai making their own Super Famicom? Well, this isn't the most obscure thing out there. Various third-party companies have produced their own version of video game hardware with the permission of the original companies. But that's the thing, I don't think Nintendo wanted this. A Super Famicom you could use a stylus on. Yeah, you can also play it on the bus, I guess. And that brings us to one of the most well-known canceled game consoles of all time, or in this case, add-ons. Sega released the Sega CD add-on for the Sega Genesis. CDs were the future, after all. Nintendo looked at that and said, oh man, we need to f*** up too. They partnered with Sony to make the SNES CD, an add-on for the Super Nintendo that would be able to play games off of a CD. After Nintendo reread their contract with Sony, it was lame, so they partnered with Philips instead for this imaginary CD add-on that never came out. That's the excuse everybody gives when they're hiding something. The SNES CD add-on never came out, regardless of it being manufactured by Sony or Philips, but through the initial first partnership, Sony created their own version of the SNES with the CD add-on built in the Nintendo PlayStation. Well, oh, thank God Nintendo killed the deal with Sony. They definitely saved some money by not releasing a CD add-on and instead created their biggest competitor ever who they've consistently lost to time and time again. At least it didn't make the Atari Jaguar duo. Oh my God, Atari, piss out. Atari reigns supreme in terms of most unreleased sh the Jaguar Duo it was simply combining the Jaguar and Jaguar CD add-on to create something you didn't want to play. Now, Sega originally had plans to create a console in between the release of the Genesis, Sega CD, 32X, and the Sega Saturn. That would be called the Sega Neptune. This was to be a Sega Genesis with a 32X built-in, a 32-bit cartridge-based console, not to be confused with the Sega Saturn, a 32-bit CD-based console, or the Sega Jupiter, another canceled 32-bit cartridge-based console, or the Sega Pluto, a canceled Sega Saturn with the Netlink adapter built-in. I took an astronomy class once, this was all I took away from it. Around this general time was when Nintendo was working on a new handheld entitled Project Atlantis. It had a whole bunch of this in 1995. That wasn't gonna work. So they held off on the core concept until the Game Boy Advance in 2001. That's the thing, a lot of these canceled systems were just a bit too ahead of their time. That's comparable to the Panasonic M2 back in 96. It may have included DVD playback. And this Hasbro thing. It was canceled around the same time, this one focusing on VR. Like, come on, DVDs and VR in 96? Half of these systems were being made by companies who just... who just couldn't do stuff like that. Cutting edge graphics. Hasbro. All these handhelds never came out because, yeah, I mean, handhelds may have been an easier investment than big boy home consoles, but Nintendo cornered the handheld market. Get out of here, Nano Gear. The Infinium Phantom, a console for playing PC titles. What? It was supposed to be released back in 2004 and would have been a digital-only console, you just downloaded the games. Yeah, it was fairly ahead of its time and because of that, they kept delaying it until they lost all their money. Can you believe a company called Infinium wasn't trustworthy? But then we have the Panasonic Jungle. Yes, Panasonic has had quite the history of consoles, going from eek to yikes to what? The Jungle was going to be a handheld for playing MMOs. Good for them. Of course, I don't want to make fun of these consoles too much. They never came out. It's rude to mock things that never officially released. It's like making fun of a fetus.